All right, well, welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. We're here again with Dennis Burke. Dennis enjoyed so much sitting down with a finance professional last time that you said, gosh, I just want to do it again, right, Dennis? That's uh, Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Adam, <laughs> yes. Yeah, finance people, my, my favorite people, actually, so. I'm so glad. <laughs> Next engineers. So. Next engineers, okay, well, that's great. Well, we're thankful to have you back. For those who didn't see, Dennis talked about the 1995 to 1999 Aurora last time. I, clearly, I, at least from my perspective, just a home run design, absolute thrill. And we mentioned at the end of that video that Dennis also designed uh, the 2002 Escalade. And so we thought we'd bring Dennis back, but you've done so many cars, Dennis. The, the, I led the design team that did the Escalade. I did not personally Designed the Escalade. It, it, you know, it's it's a result of a lot of people's effort, including designers, sculptors, engineers. So, I want to right off the bat give credit to the entire team. And I have a slide in here that actually shows the entire team that worked on the vehicle. So, it truly was a team effort, as is every design. So, I just uh, you know I kind of led and orchestrated the team. So, just like any good team, like baseball team, football team, you know, they got to have a good coach. So i just like to clarify that right up front. <laughs> so it's a great team effort. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, from a uh, sales perspective, the 2002 Escalade was really what kind of put the car on the map. It really did. It really did. And I'll get into that in a minute. But um, it was extremely successful. In its first year alone, I think it sold over 60,000 units and a very highly profitable vehicle at that. And uh, needless to say, it kind of reestablished Cadillac's, you know, uh, image mm -hmm. uh, because it immediately became the car of choice for celebrities and sports figures and it went on to become almost a cultural icon. Mm. So that in itself was very, very gratifying. and. Uh, the Escalade's success continues to this day. I'll get into it, you know, that's, that's a good lead-in to my presentation here. Um, back in late 97, uh, Ford came out with the Navigator. And I remember G at GM and other companies for that matter, kind of scoffed at the idea. It was almost sacrilegious to put a luxury car over a truck platform and I know there were even people at GM that snickered a little bit and saying well geez you know that's that's kind of odd because you know typically you think of you know DeVille's and Fleetwood's and you know stretched limos and to put a, a luxury vehicle and a nameplate on a truck mm. uh, seemed a little you know out of the ordinary but it became apparent very quickly that the Navigator was a commercial success. It was really doing well. And obviously that caught the attention of not only GM, but other automakers as well. So Cadillac's quick attempt to get into that market or, you know, get a piece of the action was the 2000 Escalade, which in fairness to the design team, they had very little time and very little resources to do much more than a grill and some badges. And, um, you know, I mean, like I said, they, they did the best they could with what they had to work with. That's effectively a GMC Denali. With a it different... is effectively a GMC Denali, uh, you know, with, with, like I said, a Cadillac grill and some badges. Um, it has the Cadillac center caps, though, Dennis. So it really, <laughs> it really has a great brand character. I yeah, like, and right? we, it included emblems on the rear and some, you know. Okay. So, but you know, to squint, it didn't really stand out in the crowd. And you know, the thing is, um, you know, we suffered back in the early '80s. A lot of people remember this infamous cover on Fortune magazine in 1983 where GM was accused of badge engineering you know just taking the same basic design changing the grill and a few emblems and it kind of really hurt GM's designs mm -hmm. uh, reputation and credibility 
Um, and so we certainly didn't want to fall into that trap again and make the same mistake. We, we had to separate this vehicle from, you know, uh, the rest of the SUVs in GM's lineup. And it was a no small task. Um, around the same time, uh, GM was uh, kind of reinventing the Cadillac brand and uh, the new philosophy that they developed became known as the art and science f philosophy, uh, which they, which kind of roughly translated, here's the script, but roughly translated it meant shapes that conveyed precision uh, and, and cutting edge and it was kind of an all new approach and you know in in design for Cadillac and um, the the fact is that you know um, it uh, it really kind of paved the way for for all the future vehicles now coincidentally uh, while we we're doing the 2002 Escalade there were a couple vehicles already in development using this new art and science philosophy and one of those was the Cadillac SLR which I'm sure a lot of you will remember and you can tell right off the bat that you know it conveys that crisp sheer precise look not a lot of hard edges nice you know proportions and the SLR was still in development when we were doing the Escalade so it wasn't even out on the street yet but the model the design was progressing in the studio uh, the other vehicle that kind of went along the lines of the new art and uh, science philosophy is the 2001 CTS and here again you could tell you know there's a similarity to the SLR with the grill the vertical headlights Again, the sheer forms, the precise look, nice dynamic look to the side with a line, feature line that stretches front to rear on a nice diagonal. So we had a little, you know, we had a clue as to where we wanted to go with the design. Now, uh, unfortunately, the um, 2,800 series SUVs were already pretty much finished meaning the Tahoe, Yukon, Suburban, Yukon XL, they were done and heading toward production, which when we got the assignment in mid-99, summer of 99, those cars, those vehicles were pretty much done. So we were told that we had, uh, we had pretty severe timing and cost restraints, thanks to the bean counters. Um, There's that word, yeah, <laughs> cost, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, the timing was very compressed. Obviously, Cadillac wanted to get this vehicle out as soon as possible. So that put, you know, we had basically six months from start to finish, which typically you get a year or so or more uh, to do a complete design development. And again, uh, you know, there were cost constraints. So there's the vehicle that we were given which basically Tahoe, Yukon, pretty much the same. Sheet metal was all done, everything, you know, they were all well in the works. So this is what we had to work with. Uh, basically, we had to hold all the sheet metal from the cowl back. And we were given all new front end sheet metal, uh, which included hood, fenders, front fascia, grill, headlights. So that much we did get, which was a, you know, a big deal because that's where most of the character is in a vehicle, in my opinion. It's like a person's face. I mean, you know, if you block a person's face, it's hard to tell who it is. But the minute you see the face, ah, you know who it is. So it's much the same with a vehicle. Uh, that that face is the personality of the vehicle. So thankfully. We got a complete front end. We also got new running boards, new rear fascia, new uh, luggage rack, tail lights. So, you know, miscellaneous items through the car, uh, exterior of the car, that is, were new. And, uh, you know, we, we had to do the best with what we had to work with. 
So, um, this you is know. pretty generous. It looks like Dennis, you know, with the yellow shading. Yeah, it's you know, cons yeah, the bean counters were fairly generous. Fairly uh, generous <laughs> this time. <laughs> uh, like I said, the front end probably was the most significant thing in the vehicle, and mm. so you know, we had to take the the body and do the best we could. So immediately uh, after we got the assignment, of course, anywhere any. Uh, in any design process, you start with the sketches, okay? And we had a design team of about three exterior designers and one interior designer on our team. And Pete Lawless was one of the uh, designers on our team. And here's a few of his sketches. And you can tell right off the bat, we had a pretty good idea what the vehicle, you know, the personality it wanted to take on. Uh, you could tell by the front end with the vertical lamps, the egg crate grill, and uh, you know some of the, the the features on the side, which I'll get into in a minute. But uh, here's one of the sketches, and typically, you know, I have four sketches here. And typically, when you do a design, you fill a wall with sketches, okay? And you pick the best of the best. And uh, here's another one that again, you know, kind of conveys the philosophy uh, of the vehicle. And uh, nice job. And then the next one is a side view and it again you know kind of captures the way the vehicle ultimately turned out uh, it, you know it's really uh, uh, no coincidence that you know the vehicle and the sketches uh, you know directly correlate to each other and then last but not least you know the rear end which again we didn't have a lot to work with it was a carryover tailgate carryover quarter panels this and that but what little we did get we were able to manage to give the car its own kind of character in the rear and probably the the biggest identifying thing in the rear believe it or not was the huge uh wreath and crust uh <laughs> around the uh, key lock cylinder and i'll remember a lot of people at truck uh, uh, even snickered and they said oh my god that thing's ridiculously big it looks like a frisbee on the i back heard of them, the i heard it called the frisbee when i was there <laughs> yes <laughs> and i remember when i was presenting that in one of the meetings at truck and there were a lot of like <laughs> you know got but you know what it was the right thing to do because you could tell from four or five car lengths away, it was a Cadillac. And uh, so without doing a lot of sheet metal, you know, manipulation, we were able to convey kind of the Cadillac character in the rear with the wreath and crest, as well as some of the other details we, that we did. Um, and by the way, even the fascias had to fit over the current vehicle's bumpers. In other words, the Tahoe Yukon chrome metal bumpers, we had the, the, the uh, bumper faces that we did had to fit over those bumpers because they didn't have time to re-engineer the bumper system. Oh, so, so there's a bumper underneath there. Mm -hmm. If you peel back the fascia on a oh my goodness. Uh, on a Cadillac, you'll, you'll find a Tahoe or Yukon bumper. Um, and one, obviously, you know, once you get beyond the sketch stage, uh, then you get into the scale models. I don't have any of the scale models in progress, but here's a completed 3-8 scale model, which approximately in real life size is probably three and a half feet long, and you could s it sits on a table. And the particular model you're looking at now is a die knocked model, which is a paint film uh, that we stretch over the clay, slick down, and it comes off looking like a painted model. And then, you know, then the designers get to work and do their mock-ups, like the grill, the headlights, and everything. And, you know, it's pretty convincing. It gives you a really, really good idea of, you know, the design and whether it's going to, you know, uh, work out full size. So it's a necessary step in mm -hmm. a, the design process that we use quite a bit. Oftentimes in a, in, a, in a design program, you'll have as many as four, five, six scale models to choose from. But in this case, we kind of had to, because of the timing, we had to, had to zero in on one particular theme direction. Uh, we didn't have a pick and choose opportunity at this point. This one almost looks like the subsequent generations too, like that that design DNA kept going. Yes, yes, absolutely. It did, the original Escalade kind of set the uh, tone for all the models that followed uh, uh, afterwards. And here, here's a rear three quarter. Here you could see the, it's obvious the model's sitting on a table. And uh, it's, uh, again, you know, gives us a, 
pretty good idea how things are going to look when we jump into the full-size clay. And uh, this this was really very encouraging, and it was kind. Of, we we had a review with management, and they gave it the thumbs up, and the rest, as they say, is history. So, and, and this is a process where it's half kind of a scale model against the mirror. Correct, right? correct, correct. Exactly. That's a good point. This the thing is that we uh, oftentimes just do a half a model for you know time expediency, and use a mirror which gives the effect of a full model. So, you know, it kind of saves you the time of having to duplicate, which is, you know, a time-consuming process. So the mirror does, you know, come in handy. In fact, in one of the upcoming slides, uh, you'll see where we actually use a mirror with the full-size clay as well, for the same reasons, to avoid having mm. uh, to duplicate. Okay, so now once we got past the uh, scale model phase, uh, we get into the full-size clay, and what I have here are just some, you know, uh, quick shots of the uh, model in progress. Here you see a scanning device that scans the surface, which we feed back into the computers, and the, mo uh, the, the digital sculptors are able to refine the surfaces digitally, and then uh, it's a, like a, a iterative process. Uh, once they digitize the information, then they refine it in the computer, then we mill it back in on the model, and it's kind of a back and forth, back and forth. Because oftentimes you find that, you know, you've got to move surfaces to meet some criteria, to clear a hinge, to clear a, you know, something under the hood. So it, it, it's kind of a back and forth, but here you see the model. Uh, being uh, uh, scanned. I think there's one underneath the there's one. There's two different have. proposals here, it looks like, too, right? Uh, well, or is it one just different stages of. It's just different stages. The one half has the Dynock piece on it ah, that you see, see there, a little bit of color, uh, which wasn't removed for some reason. Mm. Uh, and here again, it's just kind of the same thing. You see the. the, the uh, electronic scanning device that goes over the surfaces and you know you, if you note in the picture everything's very very precise the gaps are exactly to specification <laughs> uh, it's you know it, it's a very very detailed process and uh, here here's a picture if you could see toward the rear of the car the rear wheel opening uh, this is the part where like we, we I just got done saying where we surfaced it in the computer and then we have to mill it back in on the clay to verify this, uh, the, the surfaces. So uh, here we peel back the, the so-called Dynock uh, to allow us to do a little bit more work in that area. Hmm. Here's one on the patio it looks like. Yeah. And I just want to point out also too, you know, I, I forget, uh, forgot to mention that even though we had to hold the sheet metal, a real, real important aspect of this vehicle's design was the cladding that we refer to it as cladding, as you might call it a molding, on the body side, which, if you look at it, has a very, very crisp edge, and that crisp edge is uh, repeated over the wheel openings. So, if you look at the surfaces underneath that molding, they're ra rather round, soft, and we were able to, through the use of the cladding, to give it that more art and science uh, feel, a little bit more the crisper look, and, and, and it really went a long way in uh, giving the car its own character. Very, very important aspect. So even though the sheet metal underneath mm. is carryover, the, the, the wheel opening moldings and moldings on the door really, really helped carry the theme through, and, and as you can see, ties into the front and rear faces. So that was a very, very important aspect of the design, quite frankly. It's amazing that kind of lurking underneath all that cladding and the fascia is the Tahoe and the carryover sheet metal. That is correct. In it. fact, the fog lamp location is exactly the same as those other vehicles. The tow hook locations are exactly the same. Mm. We, we couldn't budge those, again, for timing and bean counters. Uh, <laughs> Where's the bean counters in this photo here, Dennis? Uh, the, we, we left them we out. We left them out? We left them out, Adam. It's too good a, good looking of a group here to have the bean counters in there, huh? As I said earlier in the presentation, you know, it is, in fact, a team effort. And quite frankly, there's hundreds of more people than this behind the scenes, engineering, finance, 
manufacturing, you, you know, I mean, it, it's really a team effort. But here we have the design team, the people I worked with on this program in one of our typical patio reviews. So, so patio reviews are a uh, big part of the process. Here this was a typical patio review and we had the team gather around the model. Uh, and here in the group, I'm not going to name them individually, but you have designers, sculptors, engineers, which comprise, you know, the team that's usually assembled in the studios. You have uh, three disciplines uh, that put the vehicle together. So, great very, picture. very talented team. It was a pleasure to work with them. Uh, did a great job. Shift gears here for a minute. Let's say a few words about the interior. Uh, what Adam is holding up here is the uh, uh, 2000 uh, Tahoe slash Yukon IP and console. And this is again what we had to work with. And much like the exterior, we had to hold quite a bit of carryover because again cost and timing restraints. Uh, but uh, you know we started out with you know what we felt was a good interior but we had to give it that Cadillac touch. Mm. Next we have another Pete Lawless sketch of the interior and what we were able to get, uh, we had to carry over the entire I, uh, lower IP but we get, did get a new top pad, okay? Uh, we did get a new trim plate uh, in front of the driver and uh, we were able to get a new console and steering wheel so you know again we got bits and pieces that helped uh, you know separate the Escalade interior from the Chevy uh, GMC counterpoint counterparts rather okay here you see a picture of the full-size uh, instrument panel in progress in clay and uh, as you can see part of it is painted the top pad which is all new the trim plate are, are in clay under development, and um, you could see partial, you know, partial carpeting here. It's part of what we call a seating buck, uh, interior buck, and um, you know it's a very useful tool. Again, just like the exterior, it's an iterative process, back and forth, back mm. and forth, digital, hands-on clay modeling. And your team was responsible for both the interior and exterior data yes, on this? Yes, we had, I had the interior and exterior of this vehicle. So here you see the same model that you saw in the previous slide uh, under uh, in development. Here's the finished product. And the finished product is quite amazing because you cannot tell it from the actual vehicle. What we do is the, the sculptors have a texturing tool where they go over the clay with a tool that gives it kind of that leather grain effect and then we paint the entire in IP with uh, what we call a peel off paint it's kind of a rubbery latex and when you're all done painting putting in the mock-ups all the knobs and dials everything mm -hmm. uh, it, you, you almost have to poke it with your finger to tell whether it's a clay model or not. So it, it you know. So that's clay. That is a full clay model. In fact, you could see the seam right here from the previous photo. Oh my goodness. That's the, if you put the two side by side, you could see there's in progress and next to it, the finished product. Nobody ever puts their thumb in it and then that gets released, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, they, they put their thumb in it, they get kicked out of the studio oh, immediately. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, and there here just 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 another completed uh, uh, picture of the uh, the Cadillac Escalade interior, which you know uh, it it wasn't a great separation from the the Chevy Tahoe or the, uh, the the Yukon, but it was just enough to give it a distinctive look with the tr wood trim mm -hmm. being in the correct places. Another story is funny. Uh, one of the biggest controversies in this interior, I swear to God, it was just, it was a big, big deal. We proposed a clock in the console because a lot of your luxury vehicles have a high-end clock, Bulgari or, you know. Timex. <laughs> not, not Timex in this case, my friend, <laughs> but Panerai, <laughs> Bulgari, Rolex, you know, some of, some of the higher-end brands are, you know, associate themselves with a... Uh, 
a, a car brand. So we proposed this clock, and oh my God, oh my God, it was like, oh yeah, well, we have it, it's redundant, you get the time on the, the radio, and this or that and everything. We said, no, it, it's got to have, you know, that character, it's got to have that, you know, upscale uh, item in the interior. We won uh, the battle, quite frankly. This is a time where we actually... Uh, mm. uh, Overrode the bean counters. Um, so you had to set two, <laughs> the two clocks independently then, huh? Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> hey, you know, uh, people loved it. You know, it was a nice nice touch. But uh, the console, you know, did kind of separate the uh, this vehicle from the other our counterpoints. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Adam has the final. You know, again, we didn't have a lot of uh, leeway on even on the door trim, and uh, uh, we did get our own seats uh, the trim, and we added some wood accents on the door, and you could see wood accents on the wheel, just just enough to give it uh, an upscale feel and separate it from uh, the lower vehicles in the lineup, being the Chevy and the uh, uh, GMC. Um, and here are just some a couple photos of the finished product. And, 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 you know, they convey some of the things I was pointing out. You know, the upscale cladding, which kind of tied the front and rear of the car together. Uh, one thing that we couldn't get around, and, oh, it was it was like a knife in my heart. But the uh, in the next photo, you'll see it. The clearance we had to provide for the door swing on the rear door. Mm. There was no way around that. You can't change the laws of physics. Being, and we couldn't change the door, obviously. It was carryover, and you can't change the hinge limits or anything. So we had to provide enough clearance for that rear door to swing open mm. without damaging the cladding. And the result was a you know a fairly significant sky bout uh, in the front of the rear door. You can kind of see but it here. But it didn't seem to affect sales much. I, I, I th you know, it's like when we were modeling it, I was like, ooh, boy, you know. But... I guess a lot of people overlooked it. It's just to a designer, you know, we're kind of, you know, freaks when it comes to details. But uh, in the end, you know, still it, a great it, looking it, SUV. You well, know. It's twenty years old now. The plus the design. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's over so twenty expensive. years old now. Yeah, and like I said, we started this in mid ninety nine. Wow. I think we released it like final release was at like early two thousands, like February. Mm. And this interesting variant here, the uh, okay. Well, the previous slide was the ESV. Which, okay. Okay, which is the suburban longer yeah. version, the suburban version of the Escalade, and then obviously the EXT, which which was Cadillac's version of the Avalanche. Um, so, you know, there were several iterations that came off the original Escalade, and uh, I think translated very well on both vehicles, quite frankly. Okay, right, I'm going to make a commentary. I'm going to make a commentary on wheels. <laughs> There's a joke at design <laughs> and amongst engineering at GM that you can't give designers wheels big enough. They could never be big enough. <laughs> Come on, Dennis. This is generous. Look at that vehicle there. That's got some good size wheels on it, right? I just want to make a point that now you can make wheels too big. Okay, I mean cartoonish. <laughs> I mean, that to me is ridiculous. So, no, there is a limit as to what size wheel fits a vehicle. This obviously does not. I noticed so. you picked a Monte Carlo here, too, to <laughs> okay. make this point, just because you've got that yeah. connection or something, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, the story is, because, again, of the timing, uh, to validate a wheel, it takes a great deal of time. It's got to go through significant testing at the GM Proving Grounds to be validated. Uh, they run it through myriads of tests. And because we're up such against a tight schedule, we were told that the supplier had a wheel that was in development that would really speed up the process. It was well on its way to validation. And so I forget who the supplier was at the time. But the wheel they had, we took and we made some refinements to, minor refinements, mind you, including the center cap. And at the time, it was a 17-inch wheel. And we we were beside ourselves at Design Center. We said that this vehicle needed a much larger wheel than a 17. And I'll, I'll display that in a moment. 
uh, you know, wheel size is is a proportional thing, okay? The bigger the vehicle, the bigger the wheel, obviously. It, it just makes sense. The Escalade's a pretty big vehicle, and, and we just felt that 17s weren't going to cut it, especially since we had photos up all over the studio showing the trends mm. in wheels, and the aftermarket crowd they were all putting, you know, 22-inch wheels, you know, 21s, 19s, and we, we had a board just filled with photos displaying what the trends were out there. Well, we couldn't fight City Hall on this one with the validation uh, issue and everything. We wanted to, They wanted to get this vehicle out as ASAP, so we kind of had no choice other than to go with the 17. All that being said, I think the wheel we ended up with was a handsome wheel. You know, it kind of suit the vehicle. We just wished it could have been bigger. Mm. My next slide show demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. The top photo mm. is the Escalade with the 17-inch wheel that we ultimately had to go with. Below is the, the size wheel we would have chosen to go with had we had the opportunity. And the wheel in the lower photo, I believe, is a 21-inch wheel. But you could tell yourself, I mean, it just looks better. What's amazing to me is with, you know, Dennis has shaded here the different pieces that they were able to change. But the car was a home run, and you really disguised it and got away from that Fortune magazine cover, you know, badge engineering with really, you know, not too much in terms of the hard metal. It's yeah, I mean, you know, we thought it was a daunting task, but, you know, once the designers got into the sketches and we got into the scale models, we said, hey, you know, we might be able to pull this off. Uh, I remember Jim Dolot, one of the finance people, coming up to me in the hallway one day and says, oh, my God, Dennis, that vehicle you guys did, is a money minting machine. <laughs> See, it couldn't have been even more successful if you had all new sheet metal, Dennis, right? Probably. You know, I hate to admit it. I hate to admit it, but you're probably right. I don't think, you know, if we had new sheet metal, we could have done any better. Yeah, which is amazing, right? I think yeah. it's, it's a testament to your team that you were really able to get yep. the character of the vehicle with the constraints that you had. There were even people at design, and I'm not going to mention any names, that were very skeptical that we could pull it off. You know, it's like, well, you're not going to fool anybody. You know, underneath, it's still a Chevy. It's still a GMC. And really stupid people are going to see right through it. And I mean, again, I'm not going to mention any names, but there, there, were, there were some skeptics and thought, well, you know, but uh, we proved them wrong. We proved them wrong. See, it's uh, those, I like to say it's the finance people that <laughs> put the constraints on designers to exact and bring out that creativity, right? Okay, all right, well, yeah. <laughs> You're just looking for some credit. Okay, uh, I okay for Adam, credit. I'll give you a little credit. Okay. Wow. So glad to have you, Dennis. Same here, Adam. Great, great job. Well, thanks again. Talk to you all soon. Thanks, Dennis. Take care. Thanks for watching this interview with Dennis Burke. If you want to see another interview with Dennis, Check out the video below where he describes the design of the 1995-99 Olds Aurora. Until next time, please like, comment, and subscribe, and thanks for watching.